The word tradition is defined as the transmission of customs from generation to generation. I can't think of a better word to describe what Lionel Trains means to so many. Get ready for a sentimental journey. It's the Lionel edition of Where's the Fun From? Historians don't know how the custom of running toy trains around the base of a Christmas tree started. After the turn of the 20th century, so many electric toy trains were open Christmas morning, maybe the desire to run them immediately was too overwhelming. Although Lionel wasn't the first American company to make them, that distinction goes to Carlisle and Finch in 1896, no other company made toy trains and Christmas more synonymous than Lionel. From the company's earliest ads, Xmas marked the spot for Lionel. And over the years, the Christmas tree was as present in its print ads as was the father and son bonding. The father of Lionel was Joshua Lionel Cowan, originally Cohen, who was born in Manhattan on August 25th, 1877. When Joshua was just five years old, Thomas Edison formed the Edison Electric Illuminating Company of New York to bring his incandescent light bulb to parts of Manhattan. With his partners, Edison founded the first central power plant in the U.S., the Pearl Street Station in Lower Manhattan in 1882. The electrical age had begun. Yes, Manhattan, near the turn of the century, was quite literally an electrifying place. But for Joshua Cowan, it wasn't moving fast enough. This June 5, 1896 edition of the Evening Post reported that the 18-year-old Cohen was fined $3 for reckless bicycle riding. In the days before radio and television, products were sold largely by printed advertisements in newspapers and magazines or on billboards. Even the foremost marketing tool of the times, the Sears and Roebuck catalog, relied on black and white artist renderings to sell their goods. Store owners used elaborate window displays to attract customers, but they too were static until electricity changed everything. This newspaper ad from 1885 reads, Wanted, store window attractions suitable for a toy store. Moving figures, automations, and other novel features will be well paid for. In 1900, as the electric frontier dawned, 23-year-old Joshua Lionel Cowan formed the Lionel Manufacturing Company at 24 Murray Street in Manhattan in order to make electric novelties. By all accounts, Cowan was brilliant. Just a year prior, he had filed his first federal patent for a battery-powered flash lamp. And by then, he had also designed an electric fuse that he sold to the U.S. Navy. While walking down Cortland Street near his office one day, Cowan stopped in front of Robert Ingersoll's sporting goods store with its very massive, very motionless window display. Cowan offered to build Ingersoll an electric carriage, a shallow wooden box on wheels that moved on a crude track. This electric express, as Cowan dubbed it, promised to bring the window display to life. Ingersoll was sold and Cowan went to work. In his book, All Aboard, author Ron Hollander reports that soon after Cowan's electric display started to move in the window, a customer of Ingersoll's wanted to buy the display more than the goods that it carried. Ingersoll obliged, asked Cowan to make another one, and the day after that one sold too. The Lionel Manufacturing Company had left the station. Owing to its origins as a display, the Electric Express lacked any connection to the real world of trains. Recognizing this, Cowan designed a miniature electric car in 1901, a faithful replica of the Manhattan trolley cars that were running at the time. The following year, Lionel released the trolley with a significant addition, a coupler that allowed it to attach to other rail cars. Lionel's electric model railroad was born. The timing couldn't have been better. The first transcontinental railroad was completed in 1869, and since then, public interest in trains had been rapidly growing, when in 1903, a cultural shift occurred. Edison Films released The Great Train Robbery, the most successful U.S. motion picture made up to that point. This groundbreaking piece of new entertainment played in vaudeville houses and kinescope parlors in New York City at first, but soon spread across the U.S. This spectacle, called a movie, moved us into a shocking world of danger, thrills, and excitement, helping fuel a fandom and a national infatuation with trains. 
Early Lionel trains ran on batteries, but as more homes received electricity, two innovations propelled Lionel forward. In 1906, Cowan introduced a three-rail track system, which eventually became the industry standard. It was far superior to the previous two-rail system, where short outs were common. That same year, Cowan also introduced his first transformer, which dampened the 110-volt current in newly wired homes down to a safe 30-volt maximum. Engineers now had a throttle to increase or decrease the voltage and the speed of the train with it. Across the years, these black boxes transformed electricity and us from passive observers to active conductors. Of course, no current passed through the body of the train operator, but try telling that to anyone transformed by the magic of a model railroad. The Roaring Twenties were marked by extravagance and fun for both the nation and Lionel. Its company catalogs with beautifully illustrated covers were produced and distributed to hardware stores, toy and hobby shops, and mailed directly to kids. Lionel was barreling down the track, unaware that the light at the end of the long tunnel of prosperity belonged to another train. After the economic crash of 1929, Lionel produced some of its most expensive trains and endured losses in 1931, 32, and 33. Cowan never wavered. He struck endorsements with real-life train engineers to help drive Lionel out of receivership. Conductors like Jack Fox, Bob Butterfield, and Bill Smith told kids that Lionel trains are real, like mine. These promotions pulled Lionel out of peril, but it was a mouse that got it back in the black. It was called Lionel's Toy Sensation of 1935, when this wind-up hand car featuring Walt Disney's Mickey and Minnie Mouse was released. The pair's animal magnetism made the toy a huge success. To capitalize, Cowan worked quickly to design and release a full Mickey Mouse circus train the following year. In 1937, before the economy had fully recovered, Cowan invested an unbelievably risky sum of money in dyes and tooling to create the 700E Hudson, a replica of the New York Central Railroad System's steam locomotive. As always, his attitude was full steam ahead. Lionel prospered until the attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941 thrust us into World War II. The company suspended all train manufacturing to produce materials for the war effort. Although no trains chugged out of the Lionel factories from mid-1942 to 45, the company profited from its many government contracts. The result was a cash flow that made the decade following the war one of the company's most prolific. Lionel introduced trains that smoked in 1946. Aluminum nitrate pellets were dropped down the engine stack and came to rest on a specially made 16 to 18 volt light bulb which doubled as the engine's headlight. Once the pellet heated up on the bulb, it liquefied and smoke billowed out with realism and certainly some danger. Lionel discovered that ammonium nitrate is volatile, toxic, and corrosive. Later, pellets made from safer material, which were heated by a wire element, were introduced. Today, smoke fluid with a mineral oil base is used, with a familiar scent that stokes nostalgia in many a model railroader. There are very few toys that trigger all the senses, like Lionel trains. You smell the smoke, hear the bells, brakes, and whistles, feel the vibration of the moving train through the transformer, see the lights, the switches, and the realistic function of all those special train cars. Lionel's famous milk car was introduced in 1947. A push of a button caused the little milkman to deliver magnetic-based milk cans onto the platform in delightful fashion. Soon the entire Lionel line had rail cars with thrilling realism, like a searchlight car, cattle car, log car, barrel loader, and conveyor coal loader, just to name a few. In 1948, the Santa Fe Super Chief passenger train reached the height of its popularity. It was the first diesel-electric powered cross-country train in America when it began its weekly service in 1937. Known as the Train of the Stars due to its celebrity clientele, it ran between Chicago and Los Angeles on a daily basis by 1948. That same year, Lionel released its own version of the Santa Fe. It would eventually become Lionel's best-selling train, and the company has used it as a centerpiece in advertising, on catalog covers, and even through licensed products ever since. 
For 1950, Lionel announced the greatest advertising campaign in Lionel history. The Joe DiMaggio Show. The show featured a group of boys, all sporting shirts with the Lionel L logo on them, asking questions of the Yankee Clipper, segments on other topics, but of course, plenty of promotions for Lionel trains. The show only lasted a year, but brought Lionel a tremendous amount of publicity right at the start of the baby boom. In All Aboard, Holland reports that by 1953, Lionel had reached peak earnings of nearly $33 million. Yet financial stability in the years that followed was more akin to a roller coaster than a railroad. As more travelers chose to drive cars and travel by plane, the shrinking popularity of our nation's railroads foretold a turbulent future for Lionel. In reaction, the company produced a line of less expensive, smaller trains in 1957, dubbed Super O. That same year, in a desperate attempt to garner sales in any way possible, Lionel produced the ill-fated exclusive pastel train set for girls. This infamous train with its Easter-colored cars laid an egg. Lionel executives failed to realize that when it came to toy trains, girls wanted exactly what boys did realism. Today, the Lady Lionel train, as it's called, is a sought-after collector's item because so few were ever sold. As his company began to fade, Cowan retired in 1958. Seven years later, at the age of 88, Joshua Lionel Cowan passed away on September 8, 1965. A company called Fund Dimensions, a subsidiary of General Mills, licensed the Lionel name and steered the company through the 70s with what seemed like the perfect partnership. If anybody loves trains, it's me, Johnny Cash. Trains and trucks are rolling. Johnny Cash did a number of TV ads and promotions for Lionel throughout the 70s, boosting sales. It's Lionel Trains and Trucking, where the highway meets the track. By the 1980s, when the cash partnership had ended, Lionel found itself once again off the tracks. General Mills had made the fateful decision to move production from Michigan to Mexico. Quality plummeted and the move proved so disastrous that just two years later production was moved back to the U.S. Finally, in 1986, Lionel was saved by a man who, in a bit of foreshadowing, rescued his first train from a trash can when he was just seven years old. Richard Kuhn was walking home from school when he spotted the trash train. He redeemed the railroad, cleaned it up, and got it running again. Years later, by the time he made his first million in commercial real estate, Kuhn had left childhood behind, but not his love of trains. He was an avid collector and member of the Train Collectors Association when he bought Lionel's licensing contract from General Mills in 1986. In 1990, in a move that would characterize Kuhn's tenure, Lionel produced an incredibly detailed, die-cast remake of their legendary Lionel 700E Hudson from 1937. But his most significant contribution were the technological advancements that Kuhn spearheaded, which gave kids quite literally all the bells and whistles of a real railroad. Sound has always been a big part of the realism of a model railroad. The first train whistle was introduced by Lionel in 1935. Kuhn formed Lion Tech, short for Lionel Technology, in an effort to develop a wireless remote control system for running a model railroad. Kuhn's unlikely partner in the venture was singer-songwriter Neil Young. Young was an avid Lionel fan and the father of two boys with cerebral palsy. In an effort to develop a remote control system that was easier for his sons to use, Young's path crossed with Kuhn's and a partnership was formed. The result was the Trainmaster Command Control System and an advanced sound system for trains called Rail Sounds. With this new setup, engineers could control their trains via radio signals and with the push of a button, create smoke, hear engine sounds, and even listen to miniature railroad workers talk to each other. Dispatcher, we are underway. Over. Roger that. Have a good run. In 1994, Kuhn bought out his licensing contract from General Mills, making him the sole owner of the greatest name in model railroad history. But as strong as the name Lionel was, the company behind it continued to run out of steam. 
After Lionel filed for Chapter 9 bankruptcy protection in late 1994, Kuhn decided to sell the business to an investment firm made up of Neil Young and a holding company, Wellspring Capital Management. Once again, things started to look up. Well, you're coming. Where? Why to the North Pole, of course. This is the Polar Express. The 2004 movie, The Polar Express, was the perfect license for Lionel. All aboard! Its Polar Express train set came out with the movie and proved so popular, Lionel couldn't keep up with demand. The success of this set is also credited for having inspired other train sets with mega licenses, like Elf. Hey, what's your name? My name's Buddy. And others. I'm Harry, Harry Potter. Licensed Lionels like these and others remain hugely popular at Christmas time and have helped introduce the hobby to a whole new generation of young conductors. It's the time of year when many casual Lionel enthusiasts put away their Christmas decorations and with them their treasured trains. If that's you, maybe this year you'll let the legacy linger and allow them to run a little while longer. That's Lionel, a passion that ties the past to the present with a call of all aboard.